Good morning and welcome. There's a story about a gym which was offering a thousand rand to anyone who could demonstrate that they were stronger than the owner of the gym. And this muscle man would squeeze a lemon until all the juice ran out into a glass. And then he'd hand the lemon to the next challenger. And anyone who could squeeze just one more drop of lemon juice out would win the money. Many people tried over time, but nobody could do it. One day a short and skinny guy came in and he signed up for the contest. But after the laughter had died down, the owner grabbed the lemon and he squeezed away. And then he handed the wrinkled remains to this little man. The crowd's laughter turned to silence as the man clenched his fist around the lemon and six drops fell into the glass. As the crowd cheered, the manager paid out the winning prize and he asked this short guy, what do you do for a living? Are you a weightlifter? And the man replied, no, I work for SARS. My apologies to any SARS officials watching. But this morning we're focusing on a high ranking tax collector who cheated, not on his tax return, but on everyone else's. He'd figured out a way to skim some money off the top and squeeze the last drop from everyone's wallets. And so Jesus is passing through Jericho on his final trip to Jerusalem and he comes into contact with Zacchaeus, a very wealthy tax collector. Listen to how it plays out in our reading from Luke. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. There are three points that I want to look at this morning from our reading. The first is the searching sinner. Zacchaeus was an important person. His name in Hebrew means pure and righteous. But he wasn't thought of as being anywhere close to righteous because of the job he had. As a tax collector, he worked for Rome. He was considered a traitor by the Jewish people. He was more interested in money than anything else. As chief tax collector, he was in charge of all the other tax collectors and was able to take a cut of commission from them. Now Jericho was a great place to be for Zacchaeus because there were a lot of people coming in and out of the city on their way to Jerusalem for Passover. Jericho was considered the tax capital of Palestine, the center of a vast trade network that extended from Damascus to Egypt. And Zacchaeus was in charge of one of the three tax offices in the entire country. He may have had the best job of them all. And so not surprisingly, he was wealthy. But in the minds of people, tax collectors were often linked with murderers and adulterers and robbers and other sinners. Tax collectors weren't new to Jesus. In Luke 5, Jesus was accused by the religious leaders of eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. But while Zacchaeus was very wealthy and successful by the world's standards, he knew something was missing. You might have noticed that our reading doesn't say that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. No, he wanted to see who Jesus was. And that's an important distinction. He wanted to figure out what it was that made Jesus different from everyone else. He may not have fully understood what was going on in his heart, but Zacchaeus had a desperate need to get to Jesus. But he had at least two problems that day. The first was that he was a short man. With all the crowds pressing in, there was no way for him to get close enough to Jesus. And in this area, I can really relate to Zacchaeus. His second problem was spiritual. His sins were keeping him from Jesus. Isaiah 59 says that our iniquities have separated us from God. Not only was Zacchaeus of short stature, he, like us, wasn't able to measure up to God's standards. But I love verse 4 where it says, So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Zacchaeus was resourceful. He ran ahead of the crowd looking for a way that he could position himself so that he could see Jesus. 
He was determined to see Jesus and he didn't care what others thought of his sprinting ahead or his climbing. And I don't imagine it was a very elegant process. He didn't allow anything, not the crowd or his condition, to stand between him and his desire to see the Lord Jesus. And then we get to our second point, which is the seeking Saviour. In verse 5, we see that while Zacchaeus may have been searching, it was really Jesus who was looking for him. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Jesus took note of Zacchaeus. He stopped, he looked up, he called him by name. We see Jesus stop and minister to a searching sinner. He knew right where Zacchaeus was because he knew all about him and he was filled with compassion toward him. And this is how it always happens. Jesus makes that first move by coming to the sinner and offering him life through himself. And then he then gives Zacchaeus a twofold command, come down immediately. Get out of the tree, Zacchaeus, right now. There's always a sense of urgency about following Jesus. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. That's from 2 Corinthians. And then Jesus gives the second part of his command. I must stay at your house today. Why did Jesus express the necessity of going to the house of Zacchaeus? Why the must? The Pharisees and religious leaders would say that because Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, he was a sinner. Someone that you just did not associate with. This person should never be invited to your home and you should certainly never enter their home as a guest and you were especially forbidden to eat their food. Jesus staying at Zacchaeus' house illustrates that is what his ministry is all about. He's come to save sinners from their sins. And then we see the third point, spectacular salvation. Zacchaeus doesn't waste any time getting out of the tree. Once again, I don't picture it as being particularly elegant. He came down at once and welcomed him gladly, we're told. And he got way more than he asked for. He just wanted to get a closer look at who the saviour was. But now Jesus is coming over for dinner. He was overwhelmed with joy. That word gladly carries with it the idea of jubilant exultation. In contrast to Zacchaeus' joy, we see that the crowd begins to mutter. If the crowd was confused about why Jesus was even talking to Zacchaeus, they're really not happy when they figure out that Jesus has invited himself to dinner at Zacchaeus' home. And it wasn't just some of the crowd. The text says it was all the people, and it may even have included the disciples. And that word mutter means a low grumble. You can almost hear it if you think about it. And they were complaining, they were finding fault with what Jesus was going to do. And we might want to criticize the crowd for their response, but how many times have we responded in a similar way? We have categories in our minds of people who are really bad. It's so easy for us to think that I'm better than that person, or I'm not quite as much of a sinner as that person. But Jesus doesn't see it that way. Zacchaeus knew he was a sinner and had come to the Savior for salvation. And his conversion is clear because of the life change we see. Look at what he says to Jesus. Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, and he really had cheated a lot of people out of a lot of stuff, I will pay back four times the amount. Wow. Here and now, he says. Zacchaeus wasn't waiting to negotiate a contract with Jesus or just trying to slide by. He was committed. Jesus had changed his heart and now he wanted to demonstrate what that change was through his actions. His decision was voluntary. It came from a heart of gratitude for what Jesus had done for him. And his encounter with Jesus prompted him to want to change his life. This public confession shows the sincerity of his repentance. And as part of his repentance, he wants to right his wrongs. The thing about biblical repentance is that it always goes hand in hand with making amends, because conversion is a radical, life-changing event. He's a different man now, so he says he will give back half his possessions to the poor, he will pay back four times the amount that he's cheated to other people. And both of these responses stand out because of the cultural and religious expectations of the time. It was considered extremely generous to give 20% of your money away. Here Zacchaeus is saying 50%. And remember how wealthy he was. When he made restitution of four times the amount he had cheated people out of, 
He was following the standard that was required in the Jewish law when a sheep had been stolen and a man was convicted of the theft at a trial. You can look it up in Exodus 22. If he confessed it himself without being found out, he was only required to restore what was stolen and add 20%. Zacchaeus' repentance is obvious in that he was willing to respond as if he's already been proven guilty. He knows that his behavior was of the worst kind and he wanted to make things right, no matter the cost. We sometimes think that we are really generous if we give God 10% of our income. The mark of Zacchaeus' transformation and conversion was his staggering generosity. He learned the truth quickly, that it's impossible to serve both God and money. Before he met Jesus, his money was everything to him. But after his conversion, it took a back seat and it became something to be given away to bless others. Verse 10 sums up Jesus' mission so clearly. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus is still seeking out people who need to be saved. Just as he called out to Zacchaeus, he calls out to each one of us, come to me, come right now, because I must come into your life. I wonder whether we respond to that invitation as eagerly and joyfully as Zacchaeus did. There are four stages that Zacchaeus went through. He started off being curious. He wanted to get to see who Jesus was. And he considered, he investigated the claims of Jesus. He was then converted. The searching Savior saved him and forgave his sins. And then he was changed. His life was radically redirected after his conversion. And we all go through those various stages. Perhaps we look back on our walk with Christ and we can see all those four stages mapped out. Or maybe we are somewhere along that path, grappling with reaching to stage four, where our life is radically changed because of who Jesus is and how he works in our life. Maybe we're at the stage where we're up in a tree somewhere, looking to see who Jesus is. So perhaps you want to just be quiet for a few moments and consider where you are in relation to Jesus. And when we consider Zacchaeus, let's not just picture the short man who climbed the tree. Let's remember a man who was so despised, but had such a great desire to see Jesus, that he was ready to be laughed at. Let's remember a man who, when he encountered Christ, was so overcome that he responded instantly and changed his life. May we be inspired by Zacchaeus to make the changes in our life that are needed to draw closer to God. And may we be as eager as Zacchaeus to see Jesus. Amen.